This is Jim Martirano from All About Town welcoming you tonight. Uh, I have on the show tonight a guest that I've known for, uh, we, were, we were laughing before, longer than I can remember. I mean, it has to go back to the 70s. And um, I've had a lot of guests on the show for over 27 years of having this show. And there's no one that has better, more character, more integrity, more intelligent, and a better contributor to society than my guest tonight. I, I welcome to the show, Susan Case. Welcome aboard. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for having me. So let's go back a little bit. I mean, I remember you <coughs> when when you were just starting out and even just starting to go to law school. And and what was your ambition? When you first started out, you went to law school, and you were thinking about becoming a lawyer. Did you have in mind any, any particular path, career path? I really loved criminal law. So I, when I, my father was a judge in Yonkers for many years. He unfortunately passed away when I was 22 in my orientation week of law school. But when I was very young, seven or eight years old, I would go to court with him and Saturday mornings we'd go to Saturday morning criminal arraignments. I found it fascinating, fascinating. So when you're in elementary school and they fill out the, the, um, the yearbook, people, what do you want to be when you grow up? I knew in second grade I wanted to be a lawyer. Really? Yeah. yeah. So I have to say I'm, 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 I'm biased, okay? I mean, I, I've known Susan so, so, so long, and I've always cared about her because she's a great person. But I knew, I knew her dad. And my first trial, I mean, I'm, I'm an ancient person right now, but when I started in 1974, uh, my first trial was in front of your dad, a civil case, and he was just so nice to me. Uh, and, uh, and later, he was so friendly and warm. I remember I had a, guy, a friend named Richard Hollihan, and I, he was having a birthday. I don't remember how old he was, uh, but I invited your dad. It was on, uh, across the street from the courthouse, and he came to the birthday party and he was just so so warm and wonderful. Uh, you know, you'd never think, you know, that he was this important judge. Uh, he just was a regular person who cared about people. And we, everybody loved your dad. They did. They did. You know, he had, a, he had a great reputation. He was, at the time of his death, he was the chief judge in Yonkers City Court. He had been working on the construction of a new courthouse. And he died in 1986. The courthouse was dedicated in 1990, and they named it after him. It's just a wonderful. I, I worked here uh, in New Yorktown for 20 years. I'm still trying to get them to name even a fire hydrant after me, but I, <laughs> I have had no luck whatsoever. Fantastic. So you went to law school, and you, you wanted to, to major in, in criminal law. When you got out of law school, what, what kind of decision-making did you go through, process did you go through? I, really, I wanted to be a prosecutor, and I applied to the Westchester DA's office and was hired. So right out of law school, I started in the Westchester DA's office, and I was there for almost 15 years. So while I was in Westchester, they start, back then they started you out in motions and appeals where you learn what the law is, you do your motions, you do your appeals. Then you go out into local court where you try and han handle and try misdemeanor cases, and I think that's when I met you, in Yorktown. So I was in Yorktown, Peekskill local court, I was in Greenberg local court, I was in Mount Vernon local court. Back then you were in local court for about four or five years. Right. And then after that, I went to the Grand Jury Bureau, where that's where you learn the nuts and bolts of felony cases, as to what the elements of felony charges are, whether a case is good, whether you can prove it. Uh, I presented many, many cases to the Grand Jury. After the Grand Jury Bureau, I went up to the Felony Trial Bureau, and I tried felony cases, pretty much general felony cases. And Those were in White Plains, right? In White Plains, yeah. And then... First trial in front of what judge? First felony trial. Any, remember any judge you tried a felony in front of? I tried... Uh, Mark Dillon. No? no? No. Mark Dillon was a local court judge when I was in local court. So felony trials, Judge Barone, oh, okay. Judge West, Judge Lange, Judge LaCava. Okay. 
So you were trying cases, and then what was the next step in your career? Well, then I had some, I got married and had some children, and I stayed in New Congratulations. York. Congratulations. A little, <laughs> little late on that. The kids are now in college, but a little late on that. Older than college. Older. Kind of. My oldest actually is graduating law school in May. So, wow. yeah, and she's... Going to become a DA. Not right away. She's going to make money, and we're hoping she goes into the DA's office after that. How many children altogether? Three girls. My youngest is applying, is taking the LSATs this summer. My middle daughter is in banking. So they're, uh, they're, they're sort of following your footsteps, at least two of them are, right? Yes, yes. So when I started having kids, I kind of stayed in the office and I went back to the Grand Jury Bureau, spent some time there, and then I left to run for Supreme That was an unsuccessful first run. What year was that? That was 2002. Okay. And then I did some criminal defense work. What was that like? I mean, here you, you had been a prosecutor. You had wanted to become a prosecutor. That's why you, why you, why you went to law school, really. You got out uh, and you became a prosecutor. Then all of a sudden, boom, you're in defense work. How'd that feel? It was, in the beginning, it was different, but it, I, I thought it opened up my mind to the other side. It, I went to the jail. I visited my clients at the jail. And, and as a prosecutor, you're, you're never at the jail. Right. You know, even as a judge, you have to visit at the jail. You have to do your, you know, your annual visitation. But so it, it was eye-opening. And, you know, everyone is entitled to proper legal representation and you do whatever you do is what I tell my girls you have to do it to the best of your ability and I had three two trials while I was a criminal defense attorney local court oh. I represented co-defendants on a it was a it was a vote case it was a theft on a vote and I won and then I had a it was another misdemeanor the DWAI drug case in Greenberg. Yeah. I won that. Wow, you won two, the two I cases. Won. Wow. There was a jury trial or judge trial? One, the co defending case was a jury trial, and the other was a non jury trial. So that must have been exciting. Yeah, that was neat. That was neat. I had never represented two people at one time, so that was, you know. So then, uh, and how long were you on the, in the def in defense work? Two years. And the, and. Then what happened? Then you ran again for the Supreme Court? Or? Then I ran for, for county. county ran for county. Um, what year were we talking? 2005? That was 2005. Yes. Yes. Ran for county. Won. Ran for re-election in 2015 and won. So you're, you're, you became a county court judge, and I know that because I appeared in front of you. <laughs> and for, for how many years in total? 19. That's a long time. So one of the things that I always look for in public service is what do people give up? What is in their heart? And what's in Susan's heart is to make contributions to society. And I tell you that because she gave up her judgeship to run for this office. So you have a lot of what they call skin in the game. I mean, you, you gave up a lot to make this move. What compelled you to do that, to give up so much? I had thought about this position for many years. Um, in 2015, after I won the election for county court, that was when um, the former DA, Janet DeFiore, was elevated to the chief judge, and Tony Scarpino was looking to run, and I was you know, inquiring around, and I learned that it wasn't going to be my time. So going back to 16, I had been thinking about it. I love being a judge. It's one of the best jobs, you know, in yeah, the world. Yeah, yeah. But 14 years of sex crimes. Um, that's, a bit, that's a bit much. It's, a bit. It's, it's a lot. It can wear on you. And I think with my varied experience, it puts me in the best position to be DA. And that's another thing. And you and I have talked privately about this because 
I was 45 years at legal aid in the Bronx, and so my perspective after handling thousands and thousands of cases is I look for young people. I look for people that we can turn around. I look for people that are just drug addicts and mentally ill people who really need help more than incarceration if possible, if possible. Clearly violent crimes, different story, but, and I, I know that uh, you're committed to the same principle. Yes, yes. Even, even the sex offenders, sex offenders are people too. Um, people who are con convicted of serious violent sex crimes, they get the appropriate punishment. But those who are on probation, that was part of what I did too. I monitored people on compliance while they were on probation. And they're entitled to live their lives as well. So it's important that they were required to do certain things. And if they were compliant, then they were able to su successfully complete probation. With respect to nonviolent felonies, misdemeanors, there are avenues today more than there were That's 20 right. years ago That's right. to divert people, alternatives to incarceration, provide them treatment so that they can learn how not to reoffend. And what's interesting, I was at um, Mayor Spano's city of the state of the city address <laughs> last week, right. and someone came up to me, yeah. and he said, and he kind of introduced himself like I didn't know who he was, and he told me his name, and he said, I wanted to thank you. You turned my life around. Wow. And he now is a pastor. He's married. He's a pastor with a couple of churches, and he invited me to his church. So I'm going to stay in communication with him, and I, I plan on going to see him at his church. So those are the stories that really move you along and, and you know encourage you to stay in public service. And one of the things that I've always looked at is the, the balancing of policy versus uh, looking at each case individually, as you know. Uh, as a DA, you have to have certain policies, you have to have uh, certain with regards to all kinds of cases. However, uh, you have to balance that with being open to a particular set of facts in a particular case. How, how, do, you ha how, do, you, how would you handle that? Well, as, as a judge of 19, for 19 years, I conference cases for 19 years, right. weekly. Weekly, um, and well, strongly, <laughs> strongly. <laughs> what I heard many times was, "Well, the policy of the office is X." That's right. And you could have policies, but you you have to look at cases on an individual basis. There's going to be exceptions to policies. There's going to be um, reasons to veer off of what is expected. That's necessary because everybody should be given a look. I don't care where they come from. They should be given the proper look and consideration. And if mitigation comes in, then that will be factored in. Mm -hmm. But a straight policy across the board, you know, if if the crime is this, then then, then, that, right. then this is X. That's I, I don't agree with that. I went back and I looked, of course, at your your state uh, your opening uh, speech that you gave when you first. And I was very, imp I'm always impressed with you, of course, but I was very impressed with you talking about compassion. You're talking about that, uh, because one of the worries uh, that I had is, w you know, the, I, we don't want to go back. We don't want to go back to the days 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when they would lock people up and throw away the key. We're, we're much more cognizant of the uh, interplay of mental illness, of drug addictions, you know, veterans issues and stuff. And, and I, I know you looked at Mimi Roca's uh, reforms that she instituted, the Second Chance Program, I think it's called, and other programs, where they even divert people where they don't even have to get involved in the criminal justice system. Fresh Start. Fresh Start. Fresh Start. Fresh Start. Yeah. And uh, you're, I, I mean, I don't want to speak for you, but I, I, I think you're committed to carrying on the successful parts of these programs, maybe even enhancing them. Absolutely. I mean, Fresh Start now is present, I believe, in almost every local court. There is the Misdemeanor Wellness Court, What's that? What do you know? What's that about? It's if you have um, mental health issues and you're charged with a misdemeanor, you can go into that court and receive treatment as an alternative. You know, and, and if you complete what's required of you, then you're redirected out. But there's that came into being, I think, last year. It services the whole county, 
So if you live in Peekskill yeah. or you live in Mount Vernon, you have to go to White Plains, and that's weekly. Yeah, that's a lot. So it's, I think it's important to spread these out, have, it, have one up north, have one down south. Um, and can, can you get, is that federally funded, do we know, or state funded? It's part of the Office of Port Administration. I'm not sure who funds it. I'm sure that's, that's always a, a barricade to, to getting things accomplished, but I do have a relationship with the Office, Office of Port Administration, having worked there for 19 years, so that I think would be helpful to be able to, you know, call up the, the AJ, the administrative judge, and say, look, can we can we accomplish this? I think. What about uh, you know? Like I, I work as one of the lawyers in drug court in Peekskill, and I believe it's the same situation. There's not drug courts everywhere. There's a, a certain grant money, and you can get. Right. But we need to have drug court courts uh, prevalently around the county. I mean, where, wherever people have drug addiction, we should have a drug court where people, it's a commitment for over a year. You have to go, right. and you have to go counseling. Right. You, have to, you take urine tests right. all the, the time. Pro the problem is the fundamental fairness. If you get arrested in an area that has a drug court, you benefit. That's right. If you get arrested in an area that doesn't have a drug court, you're can they involved. Can they transfer the case to the drug court within the West Coast Circuit? I'm not sure that they can, but they should be able to. There's the diversion part. But one of the things I was thinking about when I was driving over here was that you're in a, a primary, right? We're, we're filming this before the primary, uh, and you're uh, up against uh, t two people that are talking about reform and talking about. But the truth is that you you believe in the same reforms, but you're the only person with the experience, the know-how, the connections to actually get get them done. Right. You know, you know, people they could say a lot about. Um, my experience, which it's 34 years in the criminal justice system. And then people can say things about how I feel, but a judge for 19 years, my opinion is not out there. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been out there until I stepped down from the bench. That's true. Yeah. And then I started talking about my ideas to the office. So my, as you, as you referenced before, my kind of theme for my campaign is justice with compassion. Justice for the violent criminals and compassion for those who have mental health issues, for first time offenders who can be diverted. You wanna divert them out of the criminal justice system, but they have to be held accountable. Yeah. Without accountability, then what that means is that people commit more crimes, they encourage other people to come into the criminal justice system without accountability. With accountability and that even being have to do the program. You have to finish the program successfully. If you commit a crime, a, a theft in a store, and you could walk away scot-free, you wouldn't do it again. But if you get arrested, processed, put into a diversionary program, have to complete that, you're going to think, well, you know what? It was good for me, but it, I didn't get off scot-free. Maybe I won't go back in and do it again. It's responsibility, accountability, and then reform. You have to, you have to. People have to understand. Look, is this really the path I want to take? And if it's not, how, how can I fix this? Right. How can I fix this? I could fix this with hard work, like I'm saying, the drug program. People are. I, I, I have a, a older man who's a veteran actually, and he had a shoplift, uh, and he could have pled to something, got a conditional. Plea. Instead, he chose drug court, which is going to be a year and a half commitment. Uh, and I, I talked to him, and I said, I said to him, you, you could take the easy way out, or you could fix your life. You've been, a, you've been a drug addict for so many years. This is an opportunity, because drug court is like a family. I mean, you care about each other, and I, I'm there for him, and he can call me anytime. Hopefully, he won't call me anytime, but he can call me anytime if he needs help, and he can come and talk to us. And it, it provides a family and support system that a lot of times uh, individuals don't have that. Right, right. I visited Judge Rice's Opportunity Youth Park in New Rochelle, and it's a, it's a court for kids between the age of 18 to 24 who got caught up in the criminal justice system. Many, some are homeless. Yeah. Um, they have drug issues, and they have to go every week, and it's 
so it took me a year and a half, two years. But what he did, he's got such compassion for his court that people come in, they get them employment, they get them drug treatment, they get them housing if necessary. He's doing a great job. And that's something, I said, well, how come OCA doesn't have more of those? Yeah. And he said, not all of the, they can't find the judges. I said, really? well, well, that's, you know, kind of part of the judge's job to sit in a court like that and try to help these kids. And he's just, you could tell, he, he just loves it. They love him. It's a success. So as DA, you'll you're, you will pursue and enhance all these avenues. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were a judge for a long time. I think the last time you ran, you were unopposed. Uh, so you're now in this campaign. You're going here. What's the, what's that like? I mean, I remember when I campaigned. It was, I mean, it was wonderful and it was terrible. I mean, it was wonderful because you're meeting all kinds of people that support you and 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 feel great about your candidacy. But it's also terrible because you have to be in so many places at the same time and you're pushed and pulled in all different directions and you don't have a moment to breathe. What's it been like for you? Just like that. <laughs> <laughs> Just it's, like that. It's, it's been, you know, I've run before. You run as a judge. You can't talk about your opinions. All you can do is talk about your experience. And it, it's a limited race. It's not really political. I mean, it's political, but it's not really political. The race for DA, very political. Question that's posed to you. Sometimes the questions are questions you may not want to answer, or you don't. Okay, what's the worst? What's the most difficult question you've been asked so far about uh, abortion? No. Women's right to choose. Nothing like that. No, I've been asked that. But okay. Oh yeah, and I've been rated 100% pro-choice by the Westchester Coalition for Legal Abortion. So what I during my interview there, I reminded them that in the early 1990s, I was assigned to the Dobbs Ferry Clinic. Mm -hmm. So I prosecuted hundreds of people who were preventing women from going oh, yes, yes. to get treatment. So yeah, yeah. we had hundreds. It's the little Dobbs Ferry Police Department who was arresting <laughs> hundreds of people at a time with the, with the little plastic handcuffs. That's and, right. and we had trial after trial after trial. So yeah. that's in my history. But as, as a judge, you can't talk about that. So what's the most difficult question you've been asked? If you had to pick one. Uh, you don't have my, to shoot. My inspiration. Oh, they, they ask you what's your inspiration? Well, probably your father, no? Yes, as well as my daughters. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. I mean, it's just not a question that you would expect. Yeah. So you, you get a question like that, you're like, hmm. Well, how about this? What's the most um, strangest case you had as a judge? Come before you. Oh. <laughs> oh, you had one. I know you had one. Can you share it or is it just been? No, it's been appealed. So <laughs> it was a, a burglary of an, an individual, um, the superintendent of a building, who broke into, let himself into one of the tenants. Yeah. tenants in order to have sexual intercourse with the dog. With the tenant's dog? With the tenant's Labrador, yeah. Was it uh, on c with consent? No. And the dog, did the dog testify? No, actually it was on video. Oh. It was on video. <laughs> That's a terrible case. So. <laughs> That's, so this is I'm sorry I brought this up. That, that's a ter years terrible case. Mm -hmm. I, I have to tell you, I, I'm very close to my dog, and I'd be very upset about this. So <laughs> was this a judge trial or jury trial? No, it was a plea. Oh, a plea. It was a plea. And what was the sentence? I believe it was seven years. Seven years and for, okay. It was, well, it was a repeated conduct right. where he entered into, you know, each, it's a burglary. You're entering, yeah, no, absolutely. You're entering so it's a burglary chart, not yeah. to commit a crime, and it was three times. Yeah. 
I don't even want to ask a follow-up question on that one. I was going to ask you what what kind of dog was it, but I'm not going to. I hope it wasn't a Chihuahua. You know, I'm not going to go into that. But uh, that's terrible. Yeah, no, it was terrible. You know, it's funny because I I, I remember at legal aid. Um, you know, you have thousands of cases. I did not want to touch any. I'm just maybe I'm a terrible person. Any animal abuse cases because. I love animals so much. Well, when I was an assistant in the office, I, I was the in, uh, in charge of the animal abuse and cruelty unit when it first started many years ago. And we had dog fighting cases. Oh, we okay. had an undercover investigator from the AS ASPCA going into Yonkers with his dog who had been abused, but he was playing, you know, trying to get called in to a, a dog fighting ring because this guy quite the undercover guy he he fit in right and his dog fit in um so we had a, a long-term investigation into that there were cruelty cases i did get a call it was thanksgiving weekend it was a call at home and the question was someone at tibbetts brook park in yonkers saw someone go up and grab a goose out of the lake there by the time they figured out who it was, they went to the person's house. And they cooked the goose? They cooked it. They had it for lunch. So they said, what do you what do you want us to do? I said, you know what? If these people need food for Thanksgiving right now, let it go. Let it go. Well, hence the expression, a, a person's goose is cooked. But that's just, <laughs> that's, that's awful. Uh, speaking of gooses uh, being cooked, we're running out of time, but I, I, I just want to thank you for today. And, and uh, you, know, you know how much I believe in you. I've believed in you all these years. And Westchester County would certainly be blessed by having you as its DA. But in the waning minutes that, or minute that we have left, if you wanted to make an appeal to people that perhaps are undecided, I can't imagine being undecided and not wanting to vote for Susan Cacase, although I must say I try to put an S in your name, and I learned the lesson. No S in Cacase. <laughs> it's all C, C-A-C. Right, right. That's with Susan. So if you want to uh, make a last-minute uh, appeal to people that might be on the fence, I can't imagine that, but uh, if they are, could you? what would be, be your few words to people? Uh, it would just be that the district attorney is an important position. The office is very important. The, the DA needs to be someone who has the experience to get in the office and start running. I have that experience as a former assistant in that office, a former criminal defense attorney, and a former uh, criminal court, county court judge for 19 years working with the office. So I am seeking your support, your vote on June 25th, the day of the primary. Jim, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I mean, if not only is she smart and, and experienced, but she's got, got the appropriate heart uh, to be an, a great DA because she was a great judge. And uh, I, I just wish you the best of luck. I know you're going to be successful. This is Jim Martirano from All About Town. Hoping you go to the, if you're a Democrat and you vote in the primary, please go to the uh, go to the polls on June 25th, and and hopefully vote for Susan Case because uh, you'll be proud of the work she does. And she's going to be a great DA. Uh, thank you for watching, Jim Martirano from All About Town, saying good night. <laughs>